ערב טוב, מכובדיי. <אח> הייתי רוצה לשאת את דבריי בעברית. שפה שאותה למדתי בבית הספר עם חבר שלי בוריס. הולדתי ונסואלה. ואולם, לצערי, השפה העברית כבר איננה שגורה בפי. אפילו היידיש, שאותה דיברנו בבית, כבר לא מה שהייתה פעם. אז נסתפק היום באנגלית. שאשתי אומרת שגם בה יש לי מקום לשיפור. פרסידנט לוי, צ'רמן ג'קיר, members of the board of governors and technion colleagues, thank you for this incredibly delightful recognition. I'm truly humbled to be standing before you all this evening. I also want to acknowledge the exceptional talents and contributions of my fellow degree recipients, Bernard and Joseph and David and Odile, Emmanuel, Martin and Joe. It is a truly special honor to be recognized alongside all of you. And it's an immense privilege to say a few words on behalf of such a distinguished group. Tonight's recognition holds a special meaning to me. In the 37 years since I first set foot on MIT's campus, I have taken only one sabbatical, almost 30 years ago, in 1988. I had a choice, and I chose the Technion. I wanted to conduct research at an institution I admire and with colleagues I deeply respect. But my decision to travel to Israel then was also influenced by a much deeper, a more personal reason. My story is not much different from that of many of yours. I come from a family of refugees. In 1938, my mother and father fled Eastern Europe for the American continent in search of safety and hoping for security and opportunity. My extended family on my father's side stayed behind in their small town near the border between what are now Ukraine and Moldavia. Bukovina, I understand, you understand. A few months after my parents left, all those who remain, all 52 of them, were evacuated and eventually sent to concentration camps. Within a few years, all but one was dead. Some died of hunger, some of typhus, and some were killed by the Nazis. The one who survived was a cousin of mine, a teenager then named Penina. Somehow she managed to escape, and she found her way to what is now the State of Israel in 1945. I'm delighted that Pnina's daughters, Hannah and Tzvia, as well as Hannah's son, Ori, and Tzvia's son, Nitzan, have made to trip to campus and are here with us this evening. And I'm grateful for that. When my parents arrived in South America, first in Ecuador and then Venezuela, they had nothing. They didn't speak the language, they were very poor, and they knew no one. But what they could not give my brothers and me in material possessions, they provided in principles and values. 
and they instilled in us a deep appreciation for the value of learning. I remember my father telling me, when you have to live in a hurry, education is all you can take with you. I have carried that lesson with me throughout my life. And like so many of you, I have made education my life's work. In effect, my father was saying that as an individual, if you have an education, you have the possibility of inventing your own future. I have come to see that this is also true on a grander scale. As a society and as a nation, if you have great institutions, great universities, you can invent your own future too. And that is the theme I want to explore with you tonight. In the United States, and in many nations around the world, now is a moment of change. As we navigate uncertainty around the globe, it is useful to remind ourselves and the world that universities can be a powerful, steady force for good. In fact, I believe that this moment offers a remarkable opportunity for research universities to be leaders, leaders in education, leaders in research, and in particular, leaders in solving problems to make a better world. In other words, in other words, we need to be leaders in the kind of innovation that matters most. Let me illustrate by telling you about Joel Fink. Joel is an MIT professor of material science, a former director of MIT's research lab of electronics, and a proud alum of the Technion class of 1995 in physics and chemical engineering. Joel's research is grounded in basic science. He came to MIT as a graduate student to study how light interacts with various materials. He received a great deal of attention for a discovery he called the perfect mirror. But the application was not immediately clear. As he joined the MIT faculty, his interest in a highly reflective mirror evolved into an interest in highly reflective fibers. He could have built a whole career just advancing the science. But MIT culture challenges all of us to pursue innovation to do good for society. In this context, Joel was inspired to develop a fiber-based medical device that has been used in nearly a quarter of a million procedures to treat everything from cancer to hearing loss. The experience also opened his eyes to the wide-ranging application of fibers and textiles. Joel is a case study in the magic that happens when great science and great ingenuity come together to produce groundbreaking new ideas, the kind of innovation that matters most. Joel describes his recent work as the start of a fabric revolution, and the possibilities are enormous. Imagine a military doctor who, to, who could gather critical information from the uniform of a soldier injured in battle, or medical devices that can detect health emergencies before they happen, or a jacket that may, may neutralize chemical or biological substances in the atmosphere. Not surprisingly, Joel's research and vision have caught the attention of the US Department of Defense. And he was selected to run a more than $300 million partnership called the Institute for Advanced Functional Fabrics of America, or AFOA for short which will op actually open this coming week. Yoel's dream is to enable a manufacturing revolution by transforming traditional fibers, yarns, and fabrics into highly sophisticated, integrated, and network devices and systems. Through a company he launched, Yoel's fibers are already reaching the marketplace directly. And with a FOA, the sky is the limit. 
But innovations that have the potential to change the world are not always so fortunate. I've heard this over and over from MIT faculty and alumni entrepreneurs. They are working on big global problems. The freshwater crisis, sustainable energy, infectious disease, Alzheimer's, climate change. But too often, they find that important ideas get stuck in the lab because the process of transforming new science into marketable products takes longer than most risk capital is willing to wait. This presents an opportunity for universities to lead. If we are to deliver serious technological solutions to urgent global challenges, we must ensure that the innovators working to address those challenges see a realistic pathway for their inventions to reach society. Like the Technion and many other institutions, MIT has built a network of resources to help innovators move their ideas from the lab to the market. I briefly want to describe a unique effort we launched last October, intentionally focused on supporting those working on tough technology solutions to big societal problems. It's called the engine. The engine is an accelerator specially geared to serve new ventures based on cutting edge science and technology. It offers a distinctive package of resources, patient capital, affordable local space, access to highly specialized equipment, streamlined legal and business services, and expertise from prototype to scale up. What truly sets it apart is an emphasis on impact in assessing candidate companies, it will prioritize breakthrough answers to big problems over early profit. We believe the engine will help deliver the kind of innovation that matters most. Innovation that will hopefully produce not only new companies, but new industries, new forms of manufacturing, and new jobs. I hope these stories will leave you with two thoughts. First, I hope you will agree that through research from the most basic to the most applied, universities can shape the future by finding solutions to humanity's great challenges. And second, I hope you will agree that the universities that will shape the future in service to society must not only educate innovators, they must be willing to innovate boldly themselves. to be recognized by an institution as dedicated to innovation as the Technion, alongside peers who believe as deeply as I do in the power of education, and in front of family, friends, and colleagues, and in Eretz Israel, is an extraordinary and unbelievable honor, and I will never forget it. Thank you so very much. Thank you very, very much.